Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to episode 99 of International Relations this week. Under this series, every Wednesday at 8 p.m., we have been covering important geopolitical developments of the last one week that have a bearing on India's national interests. These discussions are strictly from the perspective of UPSC civil services examination. So if you have been benefiting from the initiative, do let us know by liking the video, share your comments below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's start with episode number 99 of IR this week by first taking a look at the topics that we are going to cover today. First, we shall talk about the defense policy reform that Japan has announced last week. It's a very important topic. So we shall examine this in complete detail. Then we shall talk about the cyber attack that recently took place against the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which apparently has been traced to China. Here we need to thoroughly understand the cybersecurity threats that India faces from China. Then we shall talk about the Eagle Act of the US. This topic is relevant for us because UPSC syllabus under GS paper 2 tells us that the policies of developed and developing nations that have an impact on India's interests is relevant for our examination. This particular law, the Eagle Act of the US, has implications for Indian interests and hence we are going to study this today. And we shall talk about an important development in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war. The United States is looking to send Patriot missiles to Ukraine. So these are some important topics we're going to cover and hence I would urge you to watch the entire session. Also, we have something special lined up for today's session. We will be running a parallel live quiz on our Telegram channel. So for that, you have to first subscribe to our Telegram channel. The link for the same has been given in the description of this video. For every topic, there shall be a live poll conducted on the Telegram channel. Take a look at these questions, participate in the poll and post your answers in the comment section of this video as well once the live stream ends. So let's start with the first topic and talk about Japan's defense policy reform. Last week, the Japanese government headed by Prime Minister Kishido has approved major changes to the defense policy of the country. Japan has brought out its national security strategy and it has approved major defense reforms which has very big implications for the Indo-Pacific region. Now some of you might wonder how is this topic relevant for India? This topic is relevant for India because India has very big interests in the Indo-Pacific and Japan is one of the major players in the Indo-Pacific. So obviously any such policy changes by a major power like Japan has an impact on India's interests in this region. For India, the Indo-Pacific is of great importance considering the threats and the challenges that we are facing in the Indo-Pacific, specifically from an aggressive China. Now, Japan's defense policy reforms are of great, great significance because Japan, even though it's a major power of the Indo-Pacific, it's one of the few countries in the world which does not have an offensive military force of its own. It's in this context that this particular development becomes very unique and very important. Japan has announced a strategic shift in its military ideology, in its military approach. And it is also planning a major hike in its defense budget. So we have to thoroughly understand this topic. And for that, first, we need to look at the background. We should understand why is this development so important? As I mentioned, Japan is one of the few major powers which does not have any offensive military forces of its own. This traces its origin to the post-World War constitution that was adopted by Japan. So here, I would like to take you back in time, take you back to the World War days. And I would like to explain why Japan has adopted a pacifist constitution. The Japanese post-war constitution, which was adopted after the Second World War in 1947, this constitution prohibits Japan from constituting offensive armed forces or in engaging in offensive military operations against another country. The reason is 
prior to the world war and also during the second world war then imperial japan which had become a fascist state it had aligned with the axis powers which included nazi germany fascist italy and other such countries imperial japan was known for its military exploitations all across asia imperial japan committed a lot of atrocities in china in southeast asia in korea and even till date people of this region of the asian region hold a lot of grudge against the japanese for the atrocities and violations that japanese forces had committed during this period so japan was a militaristic power back then this imperial fascist state was aggressively using its military for for these offensive operations against other countries which was resulting in large scale human right violations i'm sure many of you know that the second world war came to an end when the united states which was leading the allied powers dropped nuclear bombs on japan when hiroshima and nagasaki were bombed with the world's first nuclear weapons it was then that japan surrendered and the second world war came to an end so as japan surrendered as japan was conclusively defeated the western countries led by us the allied powers they used this opportunity to demilitarize japan to ensure that japan doesn't repeat its mistakes to ensure that japan does not get into such hostilities and conflicts in the future japan was demilitarized the us played a direct role in the drafting of the post world war constitution and an article was inserted which was article 9 which mandates that the japanese people will forever renounce war as a sovereign right the country collectively gave up war as a option as a sovereign option essentially the country committed that it will not be using force to settle its international disputes it will not launch any offensive military operations against any other country for settling any international dispute this was a commitment made by japan through its pacifist constitution it prohibits japan from engaging in offensive military operations that was the whole intention behind it that's the reason why japan even today does not have long range missiles ballistic missiles or it never developed nuclear weapons even though japan could have developed nuclear weapons it's all because japan adopted a pacifist constitution even if you look at the armed forces that japan has today they are known as the self defense forces is that clear they are named as the self defense forces of japan they are meant only to defend the country against an external attack they are not meant to be used in offensive operations against another country japan cannot instigate a war against another country or engage in offensive military operations as a result of article 9 of its pacifist constitution this has always been a debated topic in japan because in the last few decades japan has been facing a lot of security threats attempts have been made especially by former prime minister of japan shinzo abe who was recently assassinated as well so shinzo abe made many attempts to reform this constitution and provide japan the opportunity to constitute its offensive armed forces to move away from the defense based approach and focus on offensive operations and to reform its armed forces but these attempts have largely not succeeded because still in the japanese parliament and in the japanese society there is still a lot of baggage and hangover that dates back to the second world war era there is still a strong commitment in japan in general towards maintaining the pacifist nature of the country and its constitution so that is the reason why the changes that have been brought out the defense policy changes that have been proposed they acquire a lot of significance you need to understand that japan can change the nature of its constitution and armed forces through a constitutional amendment if japan can amend its constitution then it can move away from its pacifist constitution and it can replace the self defense forces with regular offensive armed forces like any other country many attempts have been made in the past especially in the last two decades but it hasn't received enough support 
like I said, the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was an active proponent of amending the constitution to do away with the pacifist nature of the country's constitution. But since this attempt to amend the constitution did not succeed, what Japan did in 2014 was the Shinzo Abe government reinterpreted Article 9 of the constitution. Since there was no popular support to amend the constitution itself, Article 9 was given a new interpretation in 2014, which provided for collective self-defense, which is Japan assisting other countries collectively against any security threats. And this also meant Japan could take proactive measures in the interest of self-defense in order to preempt any threats Japan could use its self-defense forces to collectively defend the country and also defend the interests of other countries other allies such as US South Korea and the others so this was a new interpretation which was given to article 9 but the exact application of this article has always been a point of debate in Japan. There are proponents who still support the pacifist constitution. There are those who oppose it who are trying to reform the constitution as well. Now this constraint on Japan has limited the military role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific. Now why is this relevant for us? How is this connected with India? See India Japan have very very close defense relations. I'm sure some of you are aware of this. We even engage in a number of military exercises with Japan. Here I would like to give you a small exercise. Read about the various military exercises that India and Japan are involved in and mention the names of these military exercises in the comments below. Take it as a small assignment. Since India works very closely with Japan in the field of maritime security, counter-terrorism, etc. Japan's defense policy is of relevance for India. And more importantly, we face few common threats. You need to understand what kind of threats is Japan facing in the Indo-Pacific. There are three specific threats that Japan is concerned about. The first major threat comes from China. As you know, China has become increasingly aggressive in the Indo-Pacific, which is threatening India's interests as well. India's security strategic interests have been directly challenged by China. Japan also faces a similar challenge from China. If China is aggravating the land border dispute, the territorial dispute with India, similarly, China has aggravated a maritime dispute, a maritime territorial dispute with Japan. I am referring to the Senkaku Diayu Island dispute that's located over here. The Senkaku group of islands, as it is known in Japan, or the Diayu Islands as it is referred to by China. These are contested islands between China and Japan. It's located here in the East China Sea. Japan has historical claims on the island, controls large part of the island as well. But China is openly challenging Japan's sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands. This has even led to confrontation between the Chinese and Japanese forces, the PLA Navy and PLA Air Force, they have disrupted the movement of ships and aircraft in and around the Senkaku Islands. They have threatened Japanese ships and Japanese aircraft from entering the region. So it's in this context that Japan perceives a serious threat, a military threat from China. There is also a possibility that China could invade Taiwan. The Taiwan issue is of great importance for Japan. So since China is seen as an imminent threat by the Japanese government, it is of great importance for Japan to be prepared for any eventuality. Japan wants to modernize its armed forces. It wants to build offensive armed forces just like any other sovereign nation to defend its security interests. So this is one of the prime reasons which has pushed Japan to introduce these major defense reforms. At the end of this topic, I will specifically talk about the changes that are being done. But before that, it's important to understand what led Japan to carry out these changes. 
even though Japan still retains the pacifist constitution, even though the pacifist constitution has not been changed, there are reforms being introduced in its defense policy. This will change the very structure of the Japanese forces, the equipment that they are operating, and also the approach, the ideology that they are adopting when they deal with security threats. That is why this topic is so important. The South China Sea dispute, the East China Sea dispute is of relevance for India because these tensions that China has created could escalate into a bigger conflict which could disrupt the global economy. A large part of India's exports and imports pass through South China Sea and East China Sea. China has similarly carried out repeated acts of aggression against India as well along the Himalayan border. Just a few days back, you saw how China triggered fresh hostilities at Tawang in Arunachal Pradesh. So this is one reason why the development in Japan is of relevance for India. Since India and Japan work very closely with each other, they coordinate their military defense policies, they take part in joint military exercises. They are even part of important groupings such as the Quad or the Quadrilateral which is focused on the Indo-Pacific. That's the reason why Japan's defense policy or military policy is of relevance for India. It will determine the future of India-Japan military cooperation as well. The other threat that Japan perceives in the region is from North Korea. As you know, North Korea has been developing nuclear weapons in direct violation of the non-proliferation treaty. North Korea is the only country in the world which joined the non-proliferation treaty and has later quit the non-proliferation treaty. It has been actively developing nuclear weapons and testing them as well. It has been developing long-range ballistic missiles and it has been testing them frequently which threatens not just South Korea but also threatens Japan and the United States. Just a few weeks back, North Korea tested multiple ballistic missiles. Some of them flew right over Japan. You can see here in this infographic, the recent ballistic missile test conducted by North Korea and how it was seen as a threat by Japan. So the increasing threat from North Korea is also one reason why Japan is gearing up its military policy. This is one reason which has pushed Japan to update and reform its military approach. The third major threat perceived by Japan comes from Russia. Because Japan and Russia also have a dispute over the Kuril Islands that are located over here. The Kuril Islands that you see here, they are strategic islands. They are located between the Sea of Okutsk and the Pacific Ocean. It's a strategic group of islands which historically belonged to Japan. Japanese inhabitants were present over here. But the Soviet Union during the Second World War would occupy these islands as Japan was defeated in the Second World War. Since then, Russia, the successor state to the Soviet Union, has controlled the Kuril Islands, which are claimed by Japan. It has often been a source of conflict and tension between the two countries, and the threat has increased, especially after Russia invaded Ukraine. Since Russia did not hesitate to use military force against Ukraine, since then, Japan is also worried about similar Russian action at Kuril Islands. Don't forget, Japan has joined the Western countries in imposing economic sanctions against Russia. Russia has criticized Japan for this and it has stepped up tensions over the Kuril Island dispute. So Japan perceives a major threat from Russia as well and these are the three reasons why Japan is moving ahead to reform its defense policy. Even though it is not able to reform the pacifist constitution, in general, Japan wants to retain the pacifist approach, but it wants to carry out few military reforms so that it is geared up for the threats that emanate from China, from Russia and from North Korea. So this explains the rationale behind the defense policy reforms. Now let me end this topic by explaining the kind of changes that are likely to take place. 
So Japan has announced that it is going to increase its defense budget to 2% of its GDP by 2027. This is a benchmark defense spending by all the NATO countries. All the Western countries aligned with US, they have this benchmark that they will spend around 2% of their GDP on military expenditure, on their defense budget. Even though Japan is not a member of NATO, it is definitely a NATO ally. It's an ally of US and European countries. So Japan is also scaling up its military expenditure and it has set out a budget of $320 billion. Now that's a massive amount. It is so massive that it will make Japan the third largest military spender after US and China. Currently US and China have the largest defense budget in the world. If Japan commits to spending $320 billion, which amounts to around 2% of its GDP, it will make Japan the third largest military spender in the world. Japan is planning to use this money to reshape its military structure. It is planning to create a joint command that will bring together its ground, naval and air self-defense forces. Essentially, its version of Army, Navy and Air Force will be brought under a single joint command for better coordination. It is looking to acquire counter-strike capability. Now, this is very, very significant. This word which Japan has used is very significant. Japan is looking to procure counter-strike capability by acquiring long-range missiles. It is likely to purchase the Tomahawk cruise missiles from the US, which has a range of more than 1000 kilometers. Currently, Japan's missiles are short-range missiles. Like I said, because of its pacifist constitution, Japan never developed long-range missiles, ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons. Now, Japan is looking at acquiring long-range missiles which can strike further targets, especially in China, in Russia. And it's looking to acquire this counter-strike capability to specifically target the enemy launch sites. If Japan has information that an enemy country is launching a strike on Japan, preemptively Japan will use this option, the counter-strike capability, to launch preemptive strikes on its on its opponents. So that is a very big change because it clearly shows an offensive inclination in Japan's military strategy, which was missing until now. Along with this, Japan is likely to reposition its military bases and ammunition. Because during the World War, much of Japan's military bases, its ammunition, war fighting equipment, they were all stationed in the northern parts of Japan. Because during the World War, the biggest threat for Japan was from Soviet Union, then from the US. So back then, Japan had stationed most of its military bases ammunition towards the northern regions. But today, the biggest threat for Japan comes from the southwest region. That is from China, then from North Korea. So Japan wants to reposition its military bases, its deployment of weapons and armed forces and all of these changes are likely to be carried out as a result of these defense policy reforms. This is likely to make Japan a major military power in the Indo-Pacific and hence it is very very relevant for India as India and Japan are very close defense partners. So this brings our first topic to an end. Now let's take a look at the second topic. We shall talk about the recent cyber attack that we saw against Ames, which has been traced back to China. A few, way, a few weeks back on the 23rd of November, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which is one of India's premier medical research centers and hospitals, was brought under a crippling cyber attack that disrupted its day-to-day -day operations. It was brought under a ransomware attack. The malware, which was used to attack the servers and computers of Ames was a ransomware. It basically encrypts all the data, locks up the servers and the computers and demands a ransom to be paid if you have to gain access back to these systems. 
So this was one of the major cyber attacks that we have witnessed recently in India. In this cyber attack, the investigation has shown that the personal health data of millions of patients who have been treated at AIMS has been stolen by the cyber attackers. This includes the health data of several VVIPs as well, several top politicians including the Prime Minister or the former Prime Ministers because this is usually where the top politicians are treated, that is at AIMS. So sensitive personal health data of patients including VVIP patients has been stolen during this cyber attack. Further investigations have revealed that the IP addresses that were linked with the emails that inserted the malware, they have been traced back to Hong Kong and China's Henan province. The first round of investigation by Indian agencies has reportedly shown a China link in the cyber attack. And this is not a new threat that we are dealing with. In fact, for many years, China has been actively waging a cyber espionage and cyber warfare campaign against India. So that is the point of discussion here. The investigation conducted by CERT in the Computer Emergency Response Team India, which is the nodal cyber security agency of India, has shown that the attack is likely to have originated from China. Because these cyber attacks can come from anywhere. There are no geographical boundaries in the virtual cyberspace. Also, cyber attackers are known to use proxy servers, virtual private networks to hide their location, to hide their identity. So it becomes very difficult in the cyber domain to attribute the attack to an individual or to an organization or even to pinpoint where exactly the attack is originating from. But forensic evidence and cyber analysis can help pinpoint the origin of the attack and the initial investigation is showing that most likely the attack originated from China and Hong Kong. So this points fingers at China's state agencies. It might be a state sponsored attack. Maybe Chinese intelligence and security agencies might have sponsored this cyber espionage, cyber warfare campaign against India. And this is no ordinary attack because it's an attack on India's critical infrastructure. It's a direct attack on our critical information infrastructure. So such important hospitals, the health data, the personal health data of our citizens, it is very much a part of our critical information infrastructure. Is that clear? So the investigation has shown that three different ransomwares were used, which are known as WannaCry, which is a variant of WannaCry ransomware, which was quite popular in 2017. And other popular ransomware such as Mimi cards and Trojan. These were the ransomwares which were used to target the AIMS servers and systems. So now here the concern for us is the nature of Chinese cyber operations. China not just targets India through these cyber espionage and cyber warfare campaigns, but it has targeted many other countries. It has targeted US, European countries, even close friends of China have been targeted through cyber attacks and cyber operations. So from India's point of view, this represents one of the biggest national security threats for India. Because there is a history behind it. You need to understand the kind of the nature of threats that we have faced from China in the cyber domain in particular. I hope you guys know that cyberspace has already emerged as the fifth dimension or the fifth domain of warfare. Traditionally, we had three dimensions of warfare. Traditionally, wars were fought on land or in the air or on water or underwater. Then the fourth dimension came up, which is outer space. As outer space activities increased, outer space became the fourth dimension of warfare. With the emergence of computers, internet and the cyberspace, the cyberspace itself has become the fifth dimension of warfare. Today, it is possible to cripple an entire country, to bring down an entire nation without actually fighting a physical war. Cyber wars have that potential. Cyber espionage can be used to steal sensitive information, classified information. It can be used to steal research material, intellectual property. It can be used to compromise the privacy of our citizens and eventually compromise the national security of the country itself. 
Let me just give you an example of the kind of cyber threats we have faced from China in the last 15 to 20 years. India was a victim of major cyber attacks which have been named as Operation Shady Rat and Ghost Net during the period 2006 to 2011. Allegedly, these were cyber attacks sponsored by the Chinese state intelligence agencies. It was targeting the Tibetan refugees and Dalai Lama, their political activities. It targeted various governments, their embassies, including India, US and many other European countries. Operation Shady Rat and Ghost Net, they primarily targeted Tibetan refugees, their interactions with foreign governments, also sensitive government data, important embassies, government offices of various countries like India, US and European nations. Then during the Commonwealth Games in 2010, which was hosted by India, there were a series of cyber campaigns targeted at India to defame India right when India was hosting a major global event. Many of these attacks were traced to Chinese origin. More recently, in 2020, after the Ladakh crisis had started, the Galwan clashes had happened, there was a major power outage in the city of Mumbai. The entire power grid collapsed. This was reportedly a cyber attack as reported by the New York Times. Several credible sources pointed out that the power outage which happened in October 2020 in the city of Mumbai was a result of a major cyber attack on India's critical information infrastructure. The Indian government has denied these allegations, of course, for security reasons to avoid embarrassment as well. But there are several credible reports who show that the Mumbai power outage that happened two years back was most likely a result of a Chinese cyber operation. In 2021, the Times group was specifically targeted, again reportedly by cyber groups that are backed by Chinese intelligence. This time the target was journalists. Journalists, Indian journalists who were reporting the border dispute that had erupted in Ladakh. This attack was also traced to a Chinese cyber group called APT. APT is an unofficial name, an informal name which has been assigned to a Chinese cyber group which reportedly has links with Chinese security and intelligence agencies. We saw one more attack on India's vaccine manufacturing units when India was rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine which was produced domestically by the Serum Institute of India and by Bharat Biotech. Both these companies were specifically targeted in a cyber campaign most likely to steal intellectual property to steal the research data. This was at a time when India was engaging in vaccine diplomacy. We were giving vaccines free of cost to many friendly nations. Around the same time, the two vaccine producers, they were victims of a cyber attack reportedly originating from China. Then last year, the Aadhaar database was also reportedly targeted. It's not clear as to how much data was compromised because the data held by UIDAI, the unique identification authority of India is highly sensitive. Apparently there was a cyber attack against the database to steal sensitive data but the details are not very clear. But most reports indicate that this attack also originated from China. Another recent incident was the targeting of Ladakh power grid in April 2022. This is also seen as an extension of the border crisis between the two countries. In the last two years itself, other critical infrastructures of India, including few ports, power plants, power grids, have all been targeted and most of these attacks have been attributed to Chinese state agencies. So this goes on to show the kind of risks and threats that India faces from China. So India is trying to plug the gaps in its cyber security. We have created a cyber security architecture. We have institutions like CERT in Computer Emergency Response Team India, which is the dedicated nodal agency to defend and protect India's cyberspace. We have even set up the Defense Cyber Agency as a armed force, as a branch of the armed force 
to deal with cyber warfare a dedicated armed unit has been created called the defense cyber agency india has also recently set up the national critical information infrastructure protection center to defend and protect the country's critical information infrastructure that is to protect all the systems networks that are linked with our critical infrastructure this includes airports seaports power plants nuclear plants power grids the banking and financial system sensitive government organizations so all these entities fall under the definition of critical infrastructure of the country so protecting their computer networks from these cyber attacks is the task of ncipc we also have the national cyber coordination center to promote coordination between various agencies to deal with cyber incidents so india has taken these measures but there is a lot more to do because there are several critical gaps in our cyber infrastructure when it comes to cyber safety and cyber security there are many steps that india has to take to deal with the modern threats related to cyber espionage and cyber warfare it's in this context that the development becomes very very important so you need to be aware of the history of possible chinese cyber attacks against indian interests now moving on to the last two topics both are relatively smaller topics first we have the eagle act which is likely to be enacted by the united states the eagle act stands for equal access to green card for legal employment this act was passed by the us congress last week it was supported by the white house it's backed by the us president it is right now in front of the house of representatives and very soon it is likely to become a legislation this law has implications for immigrants who are seeking to travel to us mainly to work in the country and even to settle in the country for the long term so obviously it has implications for the indian diaspora right this is a topic under our syllabus for international relations any development affecting the indian diaspora right whether it positively affects them or negatively affects them it is a point of interest for our exams so this law which is likely to be enacted in the us it could benefit indian immigrant workers who are settled in the us so that is the reason why this topic is relevant and we should know how this act benefits indian workers indian americans and indian workers who are settled in the us for the long term for this you first need to understand what is the green card the so called green card provided by the us immigrant workers in us they all aspire to acquire the green card what is this green card is nothing but permanent resident card permanent residency or pr once you get this tag of a permanent resident it allows you long term stay in the country it makes you eligible for a number of benefits permanent residents in the us or even in other countries be it singapore australia european countries once you are given permanent residency it will give you tremendous options in your career you can switch jobs gives you better social security makes it easier to obtain citizenship of that country eventually you get one step closer to becoming the citizen of that country you will get better access to healthcare education it also give you few limited rights to take part in the political process of that country so immigrant workers in the us from across the world they all they all desperately try to obtain the green card or which is officially referred to as the the pr permanent residency or permanent resident card lakhs of indians who work in the us who have settled in the us for the long term have applied for the green card but the problem is there is a very big wait list there is a huge wait list and the backlog is so huge that you have to wait for decades to get the green card many of them may never get the green card in their life term even in old age they might even pass away at the end of it but the green card may not be issued because there is such a huge wait list the reason is under the current system green card is given on the basis of a country based quota the us has a quota system 
every year it gives out around 1,40,000 green cards, employment based green cards and these green cards are divided for immigrants from various countries based on a quota system. Every country gets a certain percentage of these green cards. Now the problem here is that Indian skilled workers who can actually contribute to the American economy and in turn they can contribute to the Indian economy as well because they can send remittances back to our economy. They are not able to get the green cards because of the quota system. It limits the number of green cards available to Indian workers, to Indian immigrants. So now under the Eagle Act, the US is planning to do away with the, with the country based quota system and it is looking to introduce a merit based system that is based on the skills of a worker, based on their behavior, based on their economic status etc. Based on these factors, these merit based factors, green cards are to be issued in the US once the Eagle Act is enacted. Is that clear? So Indians will stand to benefit because it will remove the quota based system. Previously, your birth country would decide your ability to get the green card in the US because each country had a quota. And from India, problem is that lakhs of people, millions of them have applied for it. So there is a very huge wait list. The wait list sometimes goes to decades, even nine decades. Even if you wait for 60, 70 years, 80 years, you will not get the green card. That The wait list is so huge. A study has shown that almost 75% of the applicants in the wait list, in the backlog, may, it's made up of Indian skilled workers. Indians are the majority applicants here. So because of the country based quota system, Indian workers were not getting the green card on time. There was a huge backlog. So this act might ease the process. It's not that it will completely change the immigrant process and it's not that every worker will easily get green cards, but at least the wait time can come down if the green cards are given based on merit, based on skills, based on the contribution of a worker to the American economy. So this is likely to benefit Indian immigrant workers, Indian Americans, Indians who are settled in the country and hence it's of great interest for India because it's a topic related to the Indian community in the US, the Indian diaspora in the US. Now coming to the last topic for today, it's related to a big development in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. The US has recently indicated that it might be sending the Patriot missiles to Ukraine. As you know, since the Russia-Ukraine war began, Western countries led by US have been providing financial and military support to Ukraine to fight back against the Russian aggression. In this military support that Ukraine has been receiving, Ukraine has always demanded one specific equipment, which is the Patriot missile system of the US. Ukrainian President Zelensky has personally requested the US many times in the last few months to convince US to provide the Patriot missiles to the Ukrainian defense forces so that they can strengthen the air defense of the country. It's in this context you need to understand what are the Patriot missiles, what exactly is it? Will it really change the course of the war? Right? That is the analysis. Plus you should understand the facts about Patriot missile as well as it can be relevant for your prelims. The Patriot missile, as you can see in this image here, it is essentially a surface to air missile. It's an air defense system. It is primarily meant to target aerial threats, including aircraft, be it fighter jets, reconnaissance aircraft, drones, cruise missiles, and even short range ballistic missiles. It's an air defense platform, and each Patriot battery that you see here in the image consists of a full-fledged truck along with the surface to air missiles equipped with launchers and it has its own standalone radar system, a control station and even a power generator. So it's a self-sufficient, a self-contained equipment, air defense equipment that can be used to target aerial threats, aircrafts, cruise missiles, 
especially short range ballistic missiles can be easily targeted and the US claims that it is one of the most effective air defense systems in the world. The US believes that this could change the course of the war because it could help Ukraine to target the cheap Iranian missiles and Iranian drones that Russia has been using off late in the war. As Russia was depleting its own armed forces and its military equipment, it has started relying on Iranian missiles and Iranian drones to continue the war, to propagate the war in Ukraine. So the US is looking to provide the Patriot batteries, the air defense missile systems to Ukraine to help Ukraine target any aerial threats coming from Russia, particularly the Iranian drones and, and Iranian ballistic missiles. So US says it could be a game changer. It could strengthen the Ukrainian fight, Ukrainian resistance against the Russian aggression. But experts point out that there are limitations. Experts argue that Patriot missiles are not cost effective. They are very expensive. Each missile will cost few million dollars, around four million dollars to be very specific. If you consider the whole battery, right, the cost of firing each missile will run up to few million dollars. So this doesn't make financial economic sense when you are using a million dollar missile to shoot down cheap drones and short range missiles of other countries, especially the Iranian missiles. Because they hardly cost few thousand dollars. The small drones that Russia has procured from Iran, it will not cost more than 25, 30 thousand dollars. So using million dollar missile to shoot down cheaper drones doesn't make any economic sense. It's not cost effective. Plus the other problem is to maintain this whole battery, to maintain one truck, around 90 soldiers are required. So logistically and operationally, it can become a challenge. Deploying them can become a huge challenge. Is that clear? Maintaining the battery, operating it requires a large number of troops, around 90 people are needed. So this may again not be an effective option. And also there is evidence to show that Patriot missile system is not one of the most effective air defense systems. Its effectiveness has been repeatedly questioned. This missile system has been procured by many American allies, European countries which are allies of US, Japan, Israel, other Middle Eastern powers like Saudi Arabia, UAE, they all have procured the Patriot missiles. But repeatedly their effectiveness have been quest has been questioned, especially in the context of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has been recently attacked by the Houthi rebels from neighboring Yemen. They have used drones and even rudimentary missiles and rockets to repeatedly attack Saudi Arabia. These drones and missiles fired by Houthi rebels, they have reached their targets in Saudi Arabia and they have led to casualties and destruction. So many experts, military experts have questioned the effectiveness of the Patriot missile systems procured by Saudi Arabia. It's argued it's not one of the most effective air defense systems that are available. So it may not really change the course of the war. But still it is an important development because it shows the commitment of the US to provide advanced weaponry to Ukraine to resist the Russian aggression. It's in this context that the development becomes relevant for our exams. So on this note, I would like to bring my discussion to an end. I hope you guys have seen the live quiz on our Telegram channel as well. So please try to answer those questions. Post your answers here in the comments of this video once the live stream ends. I hope it was a fruitful discussion. Do let me know how the session went by liking the video, share your comments below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.